Living in Virginia, you're in the fast lane on the information superhighway. We've invested $3 billion in Virginia's broadband network to give you one of the fastest internet connection speeds in the world, so you can build relationships, bring new business to our state, and meet the future of education. It's amazing what we can do together. Visit VCTA.com to learn how broadband connects the Commonwealth. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're very pleased to have two members from Southwest Virginia, Senator Ben Chafin, good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Delegate Todd Pillion, good to see you. Thanks for having us. Great so to be here. how's your district doing in terms of uh, the economics there? I know you've had some hard times over the last, what, 20 years now, if not longer. Absolutely. We, we've definitely seen a downturn in the past 10 years um, with the downturn of coal and, and some of the natural gas prices dropping. So um, our districts are struggling, for sure. Um, thankfully, the Southwest delegation is working on some, uh, some terrific projects that we think will uh, re-energize our districts and get some jobs back in the area. Good. And Senator Chafin, I assume that uh, you're experiencing the, the same thing. You, you represent about 200,000 people, I believe. I, I do, uh, Woody. You know, uh, Southwest Virginia uh, has been for a number of years uh, working to uh, revitalize, working to transition from, uh, from a, uh, a, a coal uh, energy industry uh, driven uh, region to uh, to uh, other types of businesses. Uh, we we love our energy uh, businesses. We we uh, we understand them. Our people understand how to work in the energy sector, and indeed, we're kind of the energy capital of Virginia. But we also see the need to transition and to work toward. Uh, other industries so that we uh, so that we're more balanced. What has been go ahead well and uh, while remaining the energy capital of Southwest Virginia, yes. uh, Virginia we uh, I think that's like the senators say we love our energy we want to remain the energy capital of Southwest Virginia and we we are because of coal because of natural gas but now because of hydroelectric pump storage a project that uh, the senator myself and delegate Kilgore have been working on with Dominion Energy to to create um, a, a number of jobs in Southwest Virginia um, in, that will benefit all counties because of the shared revenue agreement that they've agreed to in the coal field localities. Um, we see that as just an addition to what we already have there. And Senator, you were, you were telling me earlier in terms of progress uh, made towards uh, that, that facility that there's an application that has been filed with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Yes, that's right, Woody. Uh, it's the initial uh, application, and uh, on a cold, uh, snowy uh, December morning before session last year, Delegate Pillion and uh, Delegate Kilgore and myself and my legislative aide uh, all traveled up to Bath County and viewed uh, Dominion's pump storage facility there, toured it, uh, talked about the possibilities of having something like that in Southwest Virginia, and we've all worked really hard toward that end to, to make it a reality. And uh, thankfully, I'm able to say that it seems to be moving uh, forward steadily. So, how does that work? How does that technology work? So, you have uh, you have an impoundment of water uh, that's at an altitude, and then you have another impoundment of water uh, at a lower altitude. Uh, and the water is allowed to flow down through these large pipes, uh, turning these large, uh, uh, making hydraulics that creates the energy, the turbines, and then the water is pumped back uh, at other times when it's not uh, peak, uh, at, at peak times. So what, what are we talking about in terms of uh, uh, new jobs being created? Senator, um, do you, I know it's a $2 billion investment to the region. Um, upwards of 10,000 jobs for the build out of the of the uh, the project. Now, of course, that project that build out will take a number of years, and once it's built, we're looking around 100 jobs. 
um, but uh, maybe even less than that. But it's the the infrastructure build that we're so excited about because it's gonna it's gonna impact the entire region with bringing in workers and 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 helping our local economy with just buying of sundries and staying in hotels and other things. Um, that that's what's really going to help us. And and we passed legislation last session that um, kind of expedited the build of the um, the hydroelectric pump storage station. Um, so it kind of helps us push this project along. And um, they're, they're currently looking at two different sites in south, southwest Virginia, one in Tazewell County and one in Wise County. Um, so the FERC application that the center was referring to, have, they've, they've applied for for both those sites to be investigated. And Virginia Tech is helping with, with those. One's an underground abandoned mine site, one's um, an above ground site that they're working on in Tazewell County. Now you mentioned a revenue sharing agreement. Why is that necessary? Well, that we, we believe that a rising tide lifts all ships. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Senator and I passed a, a piece of legislation this session that all the counties agreed to where they, they have a particular set amount of revenue that stems from that project that they each locality will benefit from, the seven Coalfield counties and the city of Norton. Um, so we're excited about that because no matter where this project is going, they're all supportive of the project and they recognize the importance of it. And, and like I said, not only is it one project, it could be m multiple projects in the future. The, the legislation is open-ended. You've come up with some uh, creative ideas, making lemonade out of lemons, so to speak. And I know you've got a lot of abandoned school properties that you want to repurpose. Talk to us about where that is and why that's so important. Well, we, we did. We came up with an idea uh, that uh, because of so many school consolidations in our region and school closures uh, as the population has shifted, uh, we had all these school buildings, some of them in very good condition um, and in very promising locations. And so we had this idea that uh, we would use those uh, school properties, incentivize the localities and, uh, and businesses to market and use those school properties for, uh, for businesses or for incubators and create a zone there that, uh, where you could get tax incentives uh, and incentives to locate a business uh, or an incubator uh, for businesses in those locations. And it's been very, uh, uh, very popular uh, in the communities, that thought process. So we think we've, we think we've hit a long ball with that idea. So a lot of your constituents are, ex are excited about that Absol as well, I take it. Absolutely, because they're, the fear that they have is that these, these community centers, which were schools, which were the communities were built around these, these schools, and that's where the, the hub of the, the community was, were going to become abandoned and, and eyesores and, uh, and just sit there empty and idle when they could, in turn, what our legislation will do, will help them become a, a, another hub of a business and, and re-energize that community. It's really what we're looking at doing is re-energizing Southwest Virginia. That's a good way to put it. I like that. Coal tax credits are very important. I understand that those credits had expired at one point and you've been trying to bring those back. Why is that important? That's important because coal is a, um, a revenue generator in Southwest Virginia. It's a job creator and we know that when, um, when those coal tax credits are in place that we, we have a positive movement for, for producers of coal to, to employ more people. Talk to us about those coal tax credits as so, well. So, Woody, this year uh, the coal tax credit bill, I've carried it for a number of years. Uh, during the McAuliffe administration, uh, we, we would pass the bill out. We always got it out of the Senate. It, it got out of the House, but the governor would veto the bill. Uh, this year we're hoping that uh, we get this bill passed. We've worked with the administration closely uh, on, on our bills and, uh, and, it, and this bill's different. It represents a significant compromise where we have looked at metallurgical coal. That's the type of coal that coke is made from as opposed to steam coal uh, that, that powers steam uh, power plants. And we have a lot of support for the metallurgical uh, uh, piece for the tax credit. So uh, that, that bill sailed out with bipartisan support in the Senate and it sailed out with bipartisan support in the House. We're very optimistic that the governor uh, will sign those bills. And, and I think that, that while it's important to Southwest Virginia, and everyone is aware of that, coal is important to the entire Commonwealth. 
because it, it leaves Southwest Virginia, gets on a, on a train, that train has people that are employed that drive it to, to the port. The port has people there that are working and, and then it's loaded onto a ship and, and sent out of the country lots of times. But coal is not just important to Southwest Virginia. Coal is important to the entire Commonwealth. And that's why you'll see a large um, spread of votes mm -hmm. from the Commonwealth that are, that are bipartisan as well. Uh, and, and just as, our, as you've been hearing from the administration in Washington, D.C., President Trump, Coal uh, and, and the production of steel, it's a national security issue that we be able to produce steel and metallurgical coal is how it's produced. <coughs> so it's always, it's always going to be a staple uh, in the United States that we need to be able to produce and we need to be able to, to use it to make uh, practically everything from your belt buckle to the, to the pin on my lapel to uh, the vehicle we drove to work in. Uh, and of course, all of the uses in the military. What about the Tobacco Commission? How important has it been to uh, Southwest Virginia? Well, it's, it's a huge importance. Uh, I've served on it before I was elected as a citizen um, member. Uh, Senator Chafin is on it now, of course. And, but it's a, huge, it's a huge mechanism to recruit industry to Southwest Virginia and Southside Virginia that the rest of the Commonwealth doesn't benefit from. Um, of course, they've not suffered like we suffered from, you know, the, the tobacco industry being, uh, being taken away. Um, but we, we have that tobacco um, commission that does great work and, and provides incentives to recruit businesses that, um, that other regions can't benefit from. So. Talk to us a little bit more about that commission. A absolutely. Well, we'll be meeting tomorrow. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow evening here in Richmond. And uh, we're looking at a number of things that will have a positive impact on the tobacco footprint uh, in Southwest Virginia. Uh, in terms of uh, just, just recently, we had funding of $2.9 million for a mega site park uh, in Russell County that's going to produce uh, a one-of-a-kind park uh, for Southwest Virginia with about one mile of rail siding uh, that, can, that will have gas and, uh, and 67 kV uh, electricity to it. It's just, a, it's going to be a wonderful uh, park for all of Southwest Virginia. And then, of course, broadband access. Right now, we've, we've got incentives to put broadband out into rural areas, and it's so important that we, that we continue to get this done because uh, getting broadband to our rural communities in that last mile, getting it out to those last miles, uh, represents a way for us to take the mountains that we cherish and love that we live in and flatten them for the purpose of communicating mm -hmm. with uh, the world uh, and bringing the world to us. Now what about tourism? Uh, I, I take it that that's something else you, you're looking at. It's a beautiful uh, district that you have, your senatorial <coughs> district. That whole area is just beautiful and you need to encourage, and I'm sure you're doing it now, more tourism. Definitely more tourism. We have we are doing great things with tourism in Southwest Virginia. We have taken, um, we've taken some coal, coal roads and turned them into what's called the Spearhead Trails. And those are all over Southwest Virginia now. And they're, they're bringing people in from not the Commonwealth. They're bringing people in from Ohio and Pennsylvania and other places to spend their money in, in our, our local economies, which is great. While we can benefit from those as well. Of course, we have the Clinch River that's terrific and, and provides us with a, a beautiful, uh, place to float and fish and, and, and enjoy the, the stream that's one of the, the cleanest in the world. Um, and and we, we have lots of great things. I have the Barter Theater in my district as well. Um, we, our communities are, are coming together and recognizing that tourism is just an addendum to what we already have going. What, what about that spearhead trail? I understand it's going to be mecha mechanized. Oh yes, it, it's for four-wheelers uh, and motorcycles, and um, and we've got each year we've got uh, thousands of people that are traveling to use the Spearhead Trail System. It represents hundreds of miles of these trails that are uh, located upon a coal mining land, a coal company land, and gas company land uh, that agreements have been signed to allow the use of, and uh, and it works in conjunction. Hopefully, will work in conjunction with the uh, McCoy Hatfield Trail over in West Virginia and be able to connect those trails up. That's our dream, uh, but right now, for the first time ever in 2017, we returned all the money to the Commonwealth that had been used 
uh, in that budget for supporting the Spearhead Trail. All it the money was It all came back in taxation dollars, and that's not counting all of the local uh, taxes and local monies that were collected uh, by local businesses serving that system. What right. about UVA Wise? And you can comment on what he said first. Now, uh, UVA, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with UVA Wise. UVA Wise is, we know that of, of its importance for Southwest Virginia for economic development as well as educating our youth and keeping our youth at home to be educated and trained and stay home to work. Uh, so we that's reflected in our budget as well, both Senate and the House and the governor's budget. The governor, um, both governor candidates, uh, took took the importance of UVOIs and its expansion to heart, and it's reflected in his budget. It's in our budget as well, and um, we know that the expansion of graduate programming at UVOIs is going to be a great thing, and it's going to open up a. a um, a world of opportunity for us to, to recruit industries in and, and show them that we can start training their workforce at a university level. And that's what we're hopeful for. How, how difficult is it to keep young people uh, in your district? Are, are they moving out or are you able to retain them in terms of the uh, uh, job market that's currently there? Woody, we're losing our young people. I mean, the, the, the simple truth is we've, we've had a trend of our young people moving away for uh, better job opportunities. So uh, what we're hoping to do through the funding of UVA-WISE and growing that campus uh, we want to we want to create an economic engine there in Southwest, far Southwest Virginia, uh, that ultimately one day will even rival uh, Virginia Tech and will revival uh, will rival uh, James Madison University. We've seen what those kinds of schools, once you reach a certain level of momentum, what they can do for a community, and and we know what it will do for Southwest Virginia, uh, and we we have to we have to build that uh, that economic engine. What about agriculture? Is, is it a driving force in, of course in your it, district? Agriculture yeah. is, you know, and we, we are still heavily engaged in agriculture and making sure that, that our farmers are supported. And it's, it's one of the, the biggest, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest industry uh, in our district. And, and we are always supportive of making sure that they have what they need and we're not over-regulating them and burdening them with, with the regulations from, from the state. So what are we talking about in terms of agriculture? What kinds of crops and do we have pork and do we have cattle as well? It's cattle. Primarily in southwest Virginia uh, we have a cattle, a beef cattle industry and, uh, and, it, and, it, and it's really big too. Uh, some of the counties are in the top five uh, and top ten uh, within the state for beef production. We, we actually produce in the ninth congressional district which is uh, my district is part of it, Todd's district is part of it. We actually produce uh, more cattle than any other congressional district east of the Mississippi. That's right. So it's a really big piece and, uh, and we, again, we have people that have been in agriculture and raising uh, crops and raising cattle for, for uh, generations and generations. So it's something that our people know how to do. I myself am a, am a beef, uh, beef uh, cattle operator right. and so uh, we know how to do it and uh, all, all we need is the support uh, not the regulation of our government. We need the support of our government, and we'll continue. We'll continue to feed America and the world. Timber is uh, is timber. An timber timber grow? is definitely not as much as um, as cattle. I, w I grew up on a cattle farm in Lee County, and and that's how I paid for my college education. So uh, it it teaches you a strong work ethic, and we have like like Ben was saying, we have century farms that that have been been in these families for. For, fam for generation over generation over generation, they know what they're doing, they do a great job, and we should let them do a great job. So do we have uh, corn, do we have soybean that, that, that is being uh, produced? I would say the corn that is grown is to feed your, feed your cattle. Right. Yes. We're not producing it for export. Right. What about soy? Any, any soybean? Uh, no, uh, uh, no huge amount of soybean. Uh, we're, we're primarily raising uh, grass crops, hay crops for feeding our cattle, and hay uh, for feeding our cattle. And uh, so 
uh, the land just doesn't lend itself right. to, to large uh, row crop uh, production. Any opportunities for agritourism there as well? We, we've, uh, um, we've talked about agritourism quite a bit in the recent years, so that's something we are looking at. Do you have any people there starting up wineries or breweries or anything like that? We do have. Uh, we, do. we do have wineries <laughs> and breweries popping up around the region, and they have been very fondly received uh, by the people of the region. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, I have one in Abingdon. Um, we have a great one in St. Paul. Uh, and we have a couple wineries in between, and they they go right along with the tourism aspect, but they also provide a, a nice um, place for our locals to to enjoy. What about uh, the some of the experiments that are going on with industrial hemp? As some people refer to it, rope, not dope. Right. Well, it's um, I carried a bill early on in my career here in the General Assembly. Uh, trying to move that forward. Our farmers, I think our farmers, if given the opportunity, if we can get uh, industrial hemp, get it off of the federal list right. so that our farmers can grow it, they'll know, they know how to grow uh, that type of crop. It's similar to uh, tobacco. Exactly. It's similar in production exactly. to tobacco and, and, we, and we have the type of land uh, that would, would grow that crop and I think our farmers would know how to handle it. Uh, and it could be another, uh, another staple, another farm staple uh, that our farmers uh, really need. They really need that to replace the tobacco production. You mentioned burdensome regulation. I understand that there's uh, uh, some bills that have advanced that the governor is likely to sign dealing with re the reduction uh, of, of unnecessary and burdensome uh, regulations by 25 percent, I believe. Uh, is, is that, I assume that that's something that, that pleases you. Oh, I, always. Less government is better government. We, we always believe that. So anything that we can do that is to eliminate unfunded mandates to our localities is always something that, that we, we are supportive of. We, we, we want to give our localities and our, our farmers and our communities and, and um, everyone in our districts the opportunity to thrive without overburdening them with regulations from, from the Commonwealth. Now, Go Virginia was created, I think, uh, last year. It's still in, in its infancy. It encourages uh, localities, counties to, uh, 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 to cooperate more in terms of economic development. How is that progressing in your district? I think it's progressing. Uh, we're right now, uh, we still don't have a regional uh, director. Uh, that person has not yet been found the right person for that regional uh, directorship. But, you know, Grow Virginia is, is something that uh, represents the future. I know uh, when w the delegation, the Southwest delegation, appears at economic forums, we've been speaking uh, for a number of years now to our localities that the way that we will win, the way that we will compete with larger areas is by a larger gathering of our localities and putting them together and using our resources together in order to have more resources to offer uh, for income and industry. So it's just the, 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 the day of any individual county uh, being able to always go it alone, that, that, that day is, is fast approaching yesteryear. And, and I think a, a prime example of how we've done that in Southwest Virginia is the revenue sharing that, that Ben Absolutely. and I carried this, this session for, for pump storage. That is, an, that is a prime example of how Go Virginia could work in Southwest Virginia, and I think that passage really, really resonated with the localities. That okay, this is what Go Virginia can do as well. And Go Virginia just requires two local, two counties to come together. I think, whereas we got all of our our Coalfield counties and the city of Norton to come together for that. So they they realized just like we, our motto is a rising tide lifts all ships, and we they're recognizing that, and we see that that's that's working in Southwest Virginia. I think uh, House Bill 222, uh, sponsored by Will Moorfield, is in a conference committee now because there was a different version produced by, by the Senate. It's another creative way of trying to attract businesses by, by way of uh, tax incentives, uh, relief from the state income tax. Uh, where do you think that's likely to go? Well, it's, it's uh, in conference, and we're, we, of course, we're supportive of that. We think it's a, it's a great idea. Anything that we can do to, to recruit and incentivize industry to move into the state and move into our districts is a good thing. Good, Todd, good Todd, idea. Absolutely, Woody. Todd and I both are co-patrons of that bill, and uh, we, we think that that bill, uh, if, if allowed to pass, it will be very help. It's another uh, tool. In the, in the box for us to use to incentivize 
uh, new businesses to locate there in Southwest Virginia. Uh, you know, uh, just like Go Virginia, just like we were talking about revenue sharing, that that's all pretty new to Southwest Virginia. Those mm -hmm. concepts are new, um, and and uh, getting people on board as we get our our constituents to buy into that. Um, each of our localities, regardless of where the industry might locate, can can uh, share in the the opportunities of that industry. Because far too long we had localities fighting against one another, neighbor fighting neighbor to to recruit that industry into that right. that area, and we see that that's not working. So Go Virginia and the revenue sharing that we passed are, are examples of how we should be working together. I want to focus uh, on, on health care. We, we can get into the uh, larger issue of Medicaid expansion, but I know you've been uh, really an advocate, both of you, in terms of what's happening in, in Southwest Virginia and around the nation in terms of the opioid crisis. So why don't you tell us where that is? I, I know you gave, gave another speech recently, it was a year ago, that you highlighted uh, three really tragic uh, uh, cases, so to speak, of, of uh, opioid uh, abuse, not through any fault of the individuals, especially right. the young child that, that you highlighted, but where are we now in terms of the opioid crisis? Well, we, uh, I feel like we're trending the way we want to trend, but we're, we're nowhere near where we need to be. And you know, we, we will continue, even though we passed legislation, I passed six bills last year, um, Ben was a part of those that, that would would help us to better combat the opioid epidemic. There, we're still trending upward. We we had 15 over 1,500 deaths last year from opioid overdoses in the Commonwealth. Um, we still have counties that are ranking in the top five for for overdose rates. Um, but we have seen since the legislation that was passed last year, along with the Board of Medicine's regulations, mm -hmm. we've seen a 40 percent decrease in opioid prescriptions in the Commonwealth. So. Um, 25% decrease in the most powerful opioid prescriptions. So we, we know that we're getting the numbers back that are supportive, uh, that we're doing the right thing. Um, this year we have several other pieces of legislation that have been, that have been introduced and passed um, that deal with substance exposed infants, that deal with mm -hmm. more, uh, more and better regulating from the, the um, PMP. And, and various uh, and better tracking in the lock zone. So we're 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 still making that priority um, a top priority, and we're seeing we're seeing good progress toward toward the goal that we want. A real public health crisis, but also <clears throat> excuse me, a, a criminal justice issue to the extent that you tighten up the regulations on uh, of the pres prescription drugs, and people unfortunately are addictive and they turn to heroin or other drugs. Woody, that's an, that's, that is unfortunate. It's an unfortunate truth. As we drill down uh, on, on this uh, issue, this epidemic that we have, uh, we, we do see uh, people turn to other drugs. Um, but, you know, we have got to, we've got to identify where our crisis is and we have to deal with that systemic problem. Uh, and right now, it's, it's, it's a situation that requires everybody's uh, input, the law enforcement, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the uh, physicians, uh, and, and as well as the legislators. Because we can't arrest our way out of this problem, and we've, we've known that now. For years, I think we tried that, and it didn't work, and, and we were, were placing um, people with an addiction into, into, our, um, into our jails, and they would come out of the jail system and immediately begin using again. Well, thank you both for taking the time to sit down with us today, Senator Ben, ben Chafin and Delegate Todd Pillian. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm.